What's up, everybody? Had some technical difficulties for a while. Um, <laughs> spilled water all over the wireless router. Then noticed my internet connection was utter trash afterwards. But I ended up fixing it by just completely removing the router and just going through the wireless modem. So we're good to go. Don't put your dog bowls next to the routers. Probably a good idea because you might end up accidentally kicking them and spilling water all over the fucking router. Lesson learned. So today, what we're going to go over. So I decided to go over some of the um, Nautilus bulletins, since I would imagine 99% of people on YouTube or 99% of people in general have never even read or seen the Nautilus bulletin. So um, I'm going to be going over that. Let me adjust this camera. There we go. That looks better. Okay. Hope you guys like my Christmas tree. It's pretty cool. All right. Mm, Nautilus bulletins. So last time we went over some of the Nautilus. We're going to go over the good ones. Some of them are stupid. So... You know, this was written in 1970 and 1971, I believe, or Nautilus Bulletin 1 and 2. Many of what Arthur Jones discovered was correct. Uh, a lot of it was also utter nonsense. But that's the thing. We learn as time goes on, hopefully. That's how science works. <clears throat> science, yeah, check out the tree. The tree is sick, right? You know I didn't decorate that. Girlfriend did that one. Sick. <clears throat> so I figure I'd be festive. We're festive. We're festive up in here. Okay. So one I thought that would be cool to go over was muscular potential and heredity. Um you guys may notice I like to talk about genetics a lot because it seems genetics play a huge, huge role in your response to exercise. I mean, obviously, okay, genetics play a huge role in having what is considered like a high responder or a high amount of responsiveness to exercise. That doesn't mean genetics or everything. Like, that doesn't mean if you don't have above average genetics, you can't get muscular. Fuck yeah, you can. But you probably need to have above average genetics to get an above average muscularity. One of my students in my group coaching brought up Yoel Romero. And if you look at Yoel Romero when he was a teenager... You know, I think uh, Derek from More Plates, More Dates kind of went over whether or not he was natural. Of course he's natural. He's just a sick athlete. You know, Yoel Romero has like pro bodybuilder genetics. This is him when he was a teen. Some people look like this, guys. Some people do. Um, that's him. Just a jack dude. You know, so when I talk about, you know, genetics, I mean... Most people are going to have normal genetics. Some people are going to have Yoel Romero genetics, like nasty freakish. And if you were to look up Ronnie Coleman when he was young, look at the dude <laughs> on the left. I believe, like, if you saw Ronnie Coleman, this is Ronnie Coleman before steroids. Yeah. 1991, Ronnie Coleman didn't take steroids since... Until, I believe, the late 90s. This is what we're talking about when it comes to freakish genetics. This is Ronnie Coleman pre-steroids. I know you guys cannot wrap your head around that. It's very difficult. 
But there are some people like this. Um, so when it comes to, you know, super high responsiveness to exercise, like when we're talking about good genetics, we're talking about this. We're t- this is freakish genetics, all right? There are some people out here like this. Who's that? It looks like Logan Franklin. Um, look at Kai Green. When he was young, look at Kai Green when he was a teenager on the left. Pre-steroids. All right. So when you see these like unusually ridiculous jacked people, they're 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 these people. They're probably one in a hundred, two hundred thousand. So what I'm saying is most people don't have the genetics like this. All right. And then combined with steroids, you get oops. Combine those genetics with steroids. Well, you get this guy on the right. If you look at Lee Priest. Like, look at Lee Priest on the left here when he was a teenager. Look at this freaking guy. All right. So when we're talking about pro bodybuilder genetics, we're, ta- we're talking that. <laughs> um, that yeah. 17 years old natty. I, I mean, I don't know. I would say that's natural. This is natural. I swear to God. Combine that with steroids. And what do you get? This. And this, all right, and that, and that. <laughs> so, um, you know, well, you know. So let's look at, you know, yeah. Don't forget my. Well, here's the thing: Mike O'Tren has tremendous genetics. One second, my dog is a complete jerk. All right. <sighs> So, uh, Michael Trend, great genetics, nasty genetics. Plus, I mean, you guys probably saw the whole Liver King thing going around now. I mean, nobody was surprised by that. Did Liver King actually say he wasn't taking steroids? I, I, I mean, I've never seen him say outright he wasn't. He kind of just like dodged the question. I mean, people are going to hang the guy <laughs> for getting caught with steroids. It's just like, what the fuck do you think? All right. You know, of course he was on steroids. Like, duh. I mean, everybody's like freaking out. Like, oh, Liver King caught with steroids. Well, no shit. <laughs> it's like, duh. Uh, I don't know why people get so, free, you know, whatever about it. I guess, um, you know, I guess if Liver King is saying, okay, well, I eat liver and that's why I look like this. Um, that's fraud. But whatever. Uh, but Liver King too. His genetics are sick. Plus, well, evidently quite a quite a lot of it. steroids. Um, yeah, not surprised Liver King was on gear. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like I don't know. I think people really disliked him, so now they have a reason to really fucking hate him. <laughs> but if you're like mad and surprised at Lever King getting caught with steroids, then you're just being an idiot. Like, of course he was. Of course he's taking steroids. Like, come on. I feel like if you're like, Lever King got caught with steroids, he's a fraud, he's a blah, 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 blah. You're, you're basically just being a Karen because it's like, no shit he was on steroids. It's, probably, it's You know, when you get that bit, when you look like that, come on, come on, of course. I mean, Mike O'Hearn is still denying it, but I mean, Mike Thurston also denies it. I mean, but what do you what do you expect these guys to do? I mean, Jesus Christ, they're making a living, whatever. But again, I mean, TRT is a completely different story. Thoughts on TRT? 100% pro TRT. Um, I take TRT. Every man I know in my age group at this point takes TRT. I mean, it's kind of up to you. I mean, do you need it? Sometimes, I mean, a lot of times, no. It's kind of up to you. It's like, okay, take vitamins or get your vitamins from food. I mean, if your testosterone is super low and you can't get it back up naturally, then you're just going to live a shitty life without TRT. So that's my thoughts on TRT. Um, love it. Think it's awesome. Here in Florida, basically, I mean, it's, 
you know, in a lot of states now, you just kind of walk in and say, hey, I want TRT. And they go, okay. <laughs> there you go. But you got to have a doctor, obviously, get your blood work and all that shit. Um, but today, yeah, let's go over this stuff. Let's go over this. By the way, home workout continues to be free with the Golden Era system. If you haven't tried the Golden Era system, what I've been getting a lot of, uh, I've been getting a lot of testimonials lately about joint pain elimination from the Golden Era system. And this is obvious. I mean, it's going to happen. You know, most of my clients over the last decade were people 50 and up, men and women. And, um, you know, this approach to training eliminates joint pain. In fact, my advertisements on my studio were eliminate joint pain for good. And it happened every single time. So if you have joint pain, shoulder, knee, back, wrists. I had people with carpal tunnel. A woman. Who was it? One of my female clients had carpal tunnel. Got rid of carpal tunnel. Uh, my client, John. John Seymour. He was... 27, 20 years old, had such bad back pain, he had to stretch for 20 minutes um, in order to get out of bed in the morning. Um, started doing proper exercise within two weeks. It was gone for good. Um, yeah. All right, so let's see. What was your testosterone level before TRT and now? Um, now it's, you know, just under 1,000. My doctor doesn't like to go. He thinks going over a 1,000 is just diminished return like so the way my doctor explains it is there's really a point of diminishing returns and it seems to be within the 800 to a thousand level anything above a thousand for most people you just you're not getting anything else so that's where he kind of keeps me like 900 ish to a thousand um when i started it was in the fives so it was kind of low um but, you know, so when it comes to, I mean, your doctor is going to dial it in for you. You're going to trial and error, just like dosage with all kinds of medicine. He's going to see what works for you. He's going to look at your blood work. He's going to see how you feel. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to really let you go over like a thousand or anything. Okay. So anyway, back to the topic, we're going over one of the Nautilus bulletins because most of you guys probably never saw, saw these. So here's, I mean, it's cool. You know, muscular potential and heredity. All right. So let's go over this and then we'll talk about it. So potential in this sense, the ability to build muscular size and strength can only be judged in retrospect and then only with a limited degree of certainty. After all, who can say what might have been? That's true. I mean, a lot of people who are, you know, especially my clients, my students, people who try golden era system, they'll um, will have been training for five or 10 years and think they reached their genetic limit. A lot of times, I'm, no, you haven't <laughs> because you haven't really, you've tried. Most of what people do is they, they try workout approach. It works because everything works in the beginning, right? It works. And then they do that same damn thing for a fucking decade, but they don't see any additional results. Why? Because in order to progress in terms of adaptation, in order to continue to increase muscular strength and size, the stimulus has to be more intense. It has to be greater. So that workout you did on day one that worked is not going to work in six months or a year. You have to increase the intensity of effort, the stimulus. Um, and it's simply by training to failure consistently, you're going to provide the adequate stimulus no matter what. And then you're going to have to adjust volume and frequency. So most people, even if you've been training for years, and you think you've reached your genetic potential or you haven't seen results in several years, but you continue to, for some reason, do the same thing over and over again. When you get on like a golden era type system, you're going to see almost beginner gains again, because what are you doing? You're, you're adjust, you're increasing the stimulus. Your body has adapted to that first day one workout that you found in muscle and fitness. It produced an adaptation, but if you do that same workout over and over again, you haven't really given your body a, a need to improve because it's used to doing it. And this is where training to failure really makes perfect sense. You know, we, you know, we train to failure. We get to the point where our body cannot produce movement. And your body goes, holy shit. If we can't produce movement, then we're going to become food. Or we can't get food and we can't reproduce 
the three things we're literally here for, we need movement to accomplish. So if you place a demand on your body's ability to move and prevent it or, or um, place a threat on your body's ability to move, like achieving failure, it's a very strong survival stimulus. So it's going to adapt every time. But what people notice is that they try to continue that same volume. Say, you know, the first workout you did, you did 15 fucking exercises, three or four sets of each. And then you start training to failure and then you burn out. It's because you have to reduce volume because the intensity is going up. You can't go in a tanning booth for an hour and a half. Can you? No. Why? The, the intensity of the ultraviolet light in a tanning booth is more intense. So you have to reduce the amount of time you go in a tanning booth. You can go out in the sun for an hour and a half, two hours. Why? Intensity is less. Intensity goes up. Volume goes down. All right? And that's the, the biggest problem most people face. So nevertheless, the potential muscular size of the average individual is far beyond existing average muscular size. In effect, almost any healthy man can build muscular size and strength to such a degree that most medical doctors would refuse to believe accurate before and after measurements in, in photographs. At least a fair percentage of apparently average men can build literally huge muscular size. You, know, you can double your muscle mass. You can double it. So say you have 20 pounds of lean muscle tissue. There's another bulletin where Arthur Jones goes into this. You know, about 15% of your body's actual usable muscle tissue, right? So say it's about 20 pounds. If you gain 20 pounds of muscle, you've literally doubled the amount of muscle tissue on your body. Doubled it. And 20 pounds of muscle over the course of a training career is average. Most people will do that. <clears throat> In earlier chapters, I've mentioned the relationship between muscular size and strength. And have noted that producing maximum possible degrees of strength will also produce maximum possible muscular size. But since at this point of very great importance, and a point that is generally misunderstood by almost everybody in the weight training world, I will go into a bit more detail. Most weight trainees are convinced that muscular size has little or no relationship to strength. This is obviously wrong. Why does your muscle grow? Your muscle doesn't grow just so you can look good on the beach. Your muscle doesn't grow just so you can look good in your t-shirt. Your muscle grows as a side effect of improving muscular strength. Remember, we add contractile proteins, myosin, mostly. When we add myosin proteins to a muscle cell, the muscle cell has to expand to make room for the additional proteins, right? You know, if we fill a balloon with water, the more water we put in a balloon, the bigger the balloon gets to make room for the water. The, the balloon expands to accommodate the additional water. Your muscle cell grows, hypertrophies, expands to be able to fit additional contractile tissue in there. So the muscle tissue grows as a mere side effect of improving muscular strength by adding connect, um, contractile proteins. Super basic, right? So you can't train for strength or train for size. Some people get much stronger compared to their size. Some people get much bigger compared to their strength. This has to do with things like levers, neuromuscular efficiency, muscle fiber density, muscle belly length, certain expressions of particular genes, myostatin levels, blah, 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 blah. So you can't train for either one. And at first glance, it might appear that there is quite a lot of evidence to support that belief. For example, some men with 14-inch arms can curl or press more than other men with 18-inch arms. We've all seen that. Almost all champion weightlifters lack the muscular size of bodybuilders. We've all seen that. Yet they are much stronger in spite of their smaller muscle mass. Many of the men with literally outstanding degrees of muscular size are not very strong. Certainly not as strong as they look. I mean, obviously bodybuilders are strong, but if you compare like, you know, Ronnie Coleman is a very bad example because he's strong as shit. If you compare the strength of Kai Green to Eddie Hall, I mean, Kai Green looks way more muscular than Eddie Hall, maybe not bigger, um, not even close to as strong. Why? 
there's a bunch of different factors. Levers, Eddie Hall has a myostatin inhibition gene. He's got like the he's got the Hercules gene, so that makes sense. I mean, Kai Green probably does too. There is no valid basis for comparing the strength of one individual to that of another individual. Don't compare it. Stop comparing strength between individuals. Stop comparing how much you can bench press versus how much your friend can bench press. Why? Well, different levers, different attachments, you know, different uh, tendon insertions and attachments. If some of your ten limb, limb length, um, um, just your musculoskeletal geometry in general. You know, if you have short, if you have a big chest and short arms, you're going to bench more depending on, you know, where does your muscle belly attach compared to the joint? It's going to affect leverage. Let us examine the points one at a time. First, assuming an equal length of the muscular structures, a 16 inch arm contains approximately twice as much muscle mass as a 14 inch arm. And if everything else is equal, then the larger arm will be capable of producing approximately twice as much power as a smaller one. But it does not follow that the larger arm will be able to demonstrate touch as, twice as much power or lift twice as much weight. If the 14-inch arm is favored with very short forearms and the 16-inch arm is burdened with very long forearms, then the weight being moved, the weight is being moved a greater distance by a curl by the larger arm. So for instance, if I'm doing a, so somebody with 14 inch smaller arms might be able to curl more than somebody with bigger 18 inch arms. Why? Well, look I at found the, this on the web. Shut up. Look at the length of their forearm. Hold on one second. All right. If you have a longer forearm, the weight, there's going to be a longer moment arm between the axis of rotation and the load. This weight will feel heavier with a longer forearm compared to a shorter form. So the individual, although they might have 14 inch biceps, may be able to curl more weight due to their shorter form. Where their biceps attaches to their forearm. If the biceps attaches closer to the joint, poor leverage. Further from the joint, better leverage. This is why how much weight you can lift doesn't necessarily demonstrate how strong you are. A lot of these movements. Quick question. What do you think is the key ingredient in the golden air system that eliminates joint pain? Recovery and speed of movement. So generally, the reason the joints suffer with most training is high peak forces. When you lift quickly, you generate peak forces. And these shearing forces... And these peak forces can be transferred to the joint and create micro trauma in the joint. Most people also train so frequently that they do not allow time for the connective tissue to repair. So believe it or not, if you load the muscle and fatigue it to a deep level, it will stimulate bone, ligaments, tendons, all connective tissues to increase in strength and toughness. But most people train so often and so long with so much momentum and force that they never allow that repair process to take place and they never actually allow their joints to get stronger. So they're literally undoing the stimulus in the process of producing the stimulus. It's literally like somebody pouring mud on your car and you washing it with the hose as they pour mud on your car. And you're like, well, why isn't my car getting clean? Well, someone's pouring fucking mud on the car as you're trying to clean the car. That's literally what they're doing. So the key ingredients are slow repetition speed, keeping peak forces down. Peak forces, you've never seen, have you ever seen an athlete get hurt moving slowly? Generally, when they change direction quick, or when they move quick, that's when they get hurt. Why? Force equals mass times acceleration. You have a mass. You accelerate it, you produce excessive force. This force gets transferred to the joints and can produce an injury. So that with the combination of adequate recovery time eliminates joint pain. Also, shoot, there's another thing, strength. When your muscles get stronger, your joints get stronger, especially in your knee. There are muscles of the quadriceps that run through the knee joint. When these muscles get stronger, 
the joints get stronger, plus the connective tissue. So there's a, there's a bunch of different ways, bunch of different ways. So what else here? All right. So that's interesting. So think about that. Somebody with a smaller biceps can be stronger. I mean, you know, for instance, I'm 210 pounds, 71 inches tall. I can't bench press as much as my um, friend who is has far thinner arms than I do and weighs 190. You know, he's six foot two. He, so my friend is six foot two. He's got long arms, long. They're not thin by any means, but they're smaller than mine. And he's got less muscle than me. He can bench more than me. Why? Who the fuck knows? I would say mostly because he practices the bench, but he could have favorable levers, favorable attachments for bench pressing, which is probably why it continues. So, you know, I wouldn't say he's stronger than me because he can bench press more than me, but he can demonstrate that strength in the bench press better than I can. So that's why don't ever compare your strength to the strength of an individual because there's too many other factors that come into play when it comes to demonstrating strength. That's why how much can you bench is fucking useless, irrelevant, completely irrelevant. And even if you are comparing a man's 14 inch arm to the man's uh, arm at a later date, after it is increased to 16 inches, the leverage factors will still not be exactly the same. As the size of an arm increases, the angles of insertion change. Always unfavorable. Oh, huh, that's interesting. This happens because a muscle can add significant size only by becoming thicker. And because muscle produce more power in basically reciprocal fashion, exerting a pull in approximately straight lines, obviously then, as part of the mass of a muscle moves out due to increases in the thickness of the muscle, the displaced portion of the muscle will no longer be pulling in the previous direction of pull. So as your muscles grow thicker, it may, it may produce a disadvantageous lever. So that is why when you get bigger, you don't necessarily demonstrate. So you might get twice as big, but not necessarily demonstrate twice as much strength because of the leverage changes due to the increase in muscle thickness. And as the direction of pull changes, the efficiency ratio is reduced, particularly in the strongest ranges of motion movement. Interesting. Let's see, anybody got questions? Does training to failure increase cortisol? Sure. But that's it's kind of irrelevant um, because you shouldn't be training to, fa to failure every day. <laughs> so it's kind of irrelevant. All training increases cortisol. All of it. Cortisol is something you don't even need to think about. What exercises do you recommend to people who have mild short head biceps tendonitis in the attachment in the upper arm? I have to suffer. I deal with biceps tendonitis a lot, too. What I noticed that causes biceps tendonitis is a dip. The, the parallel bar dips. That gets me bad. What I noticed that fixes biceps tendonitis is reducing elbow flexion movements for a couple weeks. You may, I would completely eliminate a biceps curl and maybe only do one pulling movement for the back until it heals. And if you're doing parallel bar dips, could be what's causing it. Because you're loading the biceps and the tendon in an unsafe passive insufficiency position. That's what caused it for me. Um, could be your chest pressing movements. You know what else it could be? Are you doing a chest fly like this? You're doing a pec deck? That'll cause it. I also notice chest fly. So uh, on a chest fly machine, I got so strong to where I'm doing pretty much the stack minus one or two plates slowly it's way too much weight for biceps tendons in my case so pay attention to that too so if i'm ever going to do a chest fly i will do a chest press first to weaken myself so i don't have to do so much weight so check that out too check the uh the chest fly chest fly machine bother my short head bicep tendon eyes yeah Why'd you lie about using steroids to use a fake name to hide it? What does that mean? A fake name to hide it? Vincent's my middle name, you idiot. Why <laughs> about using steroids? All right. Well, I mean, that's a really good way to get blocked. So goodbye. You got to notice something about um, YouTube and social media. There will be people who utterly fucking hate you for no reason. 
And um, the thing is, I give them a stage to be an asshole. But here's the thing. I can remove that stage from them quite quickly, as I did there. <sighs> Aren't you watching the Argentina versus Poland? No, I'm not interested in soccer, honestly. All right, so let's see. What else to say? Let's see. Two champion weightlifters may well be champions, primarily because they have far better than average leverage factors helping them. So champion weightlifters are generally just have favorable levers. That's why they're, they're so good. High neuromuscular efficiency. And if so, they may not need much in the way of actual muscular bulk to lift heavy weights. You'll notice that too. Champion weightlifters aren't the size of bodybuilders, but they can lift far heavier weights generally. And of course, weightlifting is art requiring far more than strength, form, style, and other factors equally important. Let's go. Uh, also, the muscular mass itself may be very efficient in such individuals, since such efficiency is an individual thing. So for instance, some people might have the ability to recruit more muscle tissue than others. Therefore, smaller individuals may be able to demonstrate or exhibit more strength because of their neuromuscular efficiency. Three, a bodybuilder with literally huge muscular size may also be primarily a result of its leverage factors. Bad leverage factors in such a case, and actually great mass and muscle would be required to lift only an average amount of weight. Let's see. Some people can rather easily build great muscular size. And some others can build great strength. And a few can build remarkable degrees of both, Ronnie Coleman. But the other style of training should be almost identical in all cases, regardless of individual difference. You cannot change potential, but it is probably greater than you think. And it might be of some interest to a few people to learn that recent evidence indicates that the best age on average for making muscular size gains is 32. Holy shit. <laughs> That's great. That's about my age. So, yeah, it's not too late. So that's the bulletin, muscular potential and heredity and how many different things affect. Um, he didn't go into what affects how big your muscles can get, but he did go into... Um, Yeah. All right. Never commented before, but seeing your content, I don't like censorship for my comments like that. Well, here's the thing. This is my channel and I can censor whoever I want. Um, this isn't the government. I'm not the government. This is my channel. And if an individual comes in and says things that are taking away from what I'm trying to do, I can censor you. This is my stage. You can have access to my stage, but I can take away access easily, okay? And then you're going to have to find another stage. This isn't the government. I don't believe the government should censor anything, but I can do whatever the hell I want. But if you, you know, if you, if you come and spam my comments, I'm just going to block you. I mean, this is my stage. You don't have to come on my stage. Go find another stage, but it is my stage. Keep that in mind. Just like if you come in my house, I can kick you out. You know, you can't say, oh, you should let everybody come in your house regardless of if you want them there. No, 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 no. This is my house. So if you come in my house and you act like a douche, you leave my house and you leave for good. All right, run through a typical day of earring. I think you mean eating. I don't pay too much attention to eating. Um, I just eat protein really and just kind of whatever. Um I don't really, I mean, I think people ex overestimate eating. I think people play too much, place too much of an importance on eating. Most of the time, your results are not where you want them to be. It's not because of your eating. It's because of you lack the correct training stimulus. But most people, since they found this training stimulus from Joey Swole or Mike O'Hearn or Muscle and Fitness Magazine, then they're like, well... They do this workout, so it can't be the workout. It's got to be my eating. No, it's usually still the workout. 
you know, you wouldn't say, okay, so Joey Swole takes two ibuprofen, it, it gets rid of his headache. You wouldn't say, okay, well, two ibuprofen will definitely work for me because it works for Joey Swole. No, you might need more. You might need less. So it's usually not your diet. Let's see. What's the best way to train with a partner? That is very vague. <laughs> You're gonna have to be a little more specific with that. Um, if you could be a little more specific, like the best way to train with a partner. Um, I okay. I mean, I'll try to answer it. So I would have your them do a set. And then right after you do a set, kind of help them reach a level of fatigue, a deep level of fatigue. And then as soon as they get done, they train you. And then you just go to exercise to exercise. I mean, I guess that's it. All right, let's see. You preach deep muscle fatigue, which creates a stimulus and mechanical damage. Well, the damage doesn't really... Apparently, according to the literature, the damage doesn't have much to do with the stimulus, apparently. Does that mean that we are expected to have delayed onset muscle soreness and be in muscular agony until the next time we train? No. That is not true. Soreness, um, soreness is a poor indicator of an effective workout. Very poor. Uh, the damage, your body seems to produce less damage as time goes on. It produces a lot of damage in the beginning and then less as time goes on, but the stimulus doesn't get worse. So according to um, according to literature, damage doesn't really have much to do with it. All right, I'm getting muscle, but also more fat. What should I? Where should I go to be lean? Like, um, you're just eating too many calories. Pay attention to your portion size and reduce um, reduce the calorie intake. If you're gaining fat, then you're eating too many calories. So. I don't know. Dr. Andy Galpin had a video about calorie surplus, and he says only about 10 to 20 percent of a surplus above maintenance calories can be used for muscle growth. And again, and again this is going to vary between individuals. So if you're eating a thousand extra calories a day, well, most of that's going to fat. All right. So what's your opinion on the what's your opinion on these on hammer strength select rise equipment? Equipment such as row machine, bridge girl, hammer strength, select rise. Uh, hammer strength select. Uh, eh, no, I don't like them. Um, well, actually, some of them are good. Yeah, hammer string select. It's okay. It's all right. I've used some of them. They're smooth. Um, let me see. Let's go back. Such as row machine, preacher girl, lap hold on. They're they're good. I like them. I've used them. I like the row. The row is great. The row is great. Preacher curl pretty much can't screw that one up. Pretty much all preacher curls are good. I've only used one preacher curl that is really bad, and it was probably about 40 years old, probably 30 years old. Tons of friction. But most preacher curls are fine. Lat pull down, probably good. Yeah. Hammers, pretty much anything by hammer strength is good. I'm 45 and can't make any progress. I know all the theory, I guess. I have 25 years of training experience. I look good, but I'm not really muscular. 175. Eight. Huh, let's see. I train the way you teach. I eat enough, sleep enough. At 31, I weighed 185, but this was at my maximum. I consider myself a hard gainer. 185 isn't a hard gainer, man. That's pretty good. Is it possible I can't grow anymore? Not really. Um, I had one of my students, most of my students in my VIP coaching, come in thinking they can't gain muscle. And then within about three months, two or three months, they have 10 pounds. They had 10 pounds. What's the difference? Generally, they think they're training hard enough, but they're not. So, you you know, I would suggest if you really want to really optimize this, 
you, I suggest you join my coaching program. The link's in the description. You book a call with me. You know, what I usually do is I take a look at your workout. I take a look at, I, I, I have my clients film their workout so I can see what you're doing and see how you're doing it. And there's always something missing. So I don't think it's that you can't make any progress. I think there's something missing. And that's what I have the coaching for. How do you feel about micro 10 minute full body exercises, six hours after a five by five morning workout? Completely, utterly pointless. Well, following a hit routine, is it okay to take a break of five to 10 seconds in between a set to adjust grip? Yep, absolutely. I highly recommend you do that. All right, what's the best way to train with a partner? Do every other exercise? Do the whole program, the other person. I just alternate. So when I train with a friend, generally I do a set. He kind of helps me with maybe some force reps or some manual resistance. And then they go. And then I help them. And then we go to the next exercise. Boom, 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 boom. That's the best way to do it. Where in Florida are you based? I'm in the Tampa area. That's about as specific as I'll get. Let's see. How often, many times during my daily workout should I fail? End of every set? Most, some. So if you look into the other videos of my channel, according to the research, one to two sets, and in many cases just one, set to failure is all that is required for an optimal stimulus if you're actually reaching failure. And if you do this, you cannot work out daily. You would certainly overtrain. So that's where the confusion is. You're under the assumption you need multiple sets. You're under the assumption you need to work out daily. But the amount of sets you do and the frequency have far less to do with your results in the workout stimulus than does intensity of effort. Intensity of effort how hard you contract or reaching failure is the driver of muscle growth. Not how many sets, not how many exercises, not what angle you hit the muscle from, not how often you work out. These are what people think drives muscle growth. No, 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 no. The intensity of the muscular contraction or intensity of effort is what drives muscle growth. Don't believe me? Let's do a little thought experiment here. Say you can do 10 repetitions of a bench press. You fail when you attempt, attempt the 11th. Which repetition of that set is the most productive in terms of stimulating growth? The first repetition or the 10th repetition. So just to recap, you're doing a set to failure, a set of 10 repetitions to failure. Which repetition do you think is the most effective in terms of stimulating growth? The first repetition, the second repetition, the third repetition, or the 10th? Obviously, the 10th repetition is more effective at stimulating growth than the first, second, or third. What's the difference between the 10th repetition and the first, second, or third? The intensity of effort involved. So it's pretty evident that intensity of effort is the driving factor. Not repetitions, not exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Do you weigh your portions of food? No, I do not. You guys got to remember, just... You know, some people have favorable genetics. Some people do not have to weigh and measure all their food to have a good physique. Like, look at Yoel Romero. <laughs> he doesn't have to do that. Most of you will. What supplements or proteins do you recommend to take to build muscle? Uh, I don't recommend any supplements other than creatine um, and any kind of protein.
Am I understanding this correctly? The harder I train, the more testosterone I lack? No. Those are not mutually inclusive. So you mean to say that free weight compound barbell type exercises are no more superior than machine exercises? No, they're not. Why would they be? You think your body knows the difference? How do we stimulate a muscle? By placing a demand on the muscle's ability to produce force. What's the function of a muscle to produce force? Tension. As long as you are producing force and tension, placing demand on the muscle's ability to do so, your body doesn't know the difference between a machine or free weight. A machine is an improved version of a barbell. The machine, the purpose of the machine is to make up for inadequacies in the barbell or free weight. So this is what we had. We had the first weightlifting inventions we had were free weights and barbells. There were problems with free weights and barbells. They could be dangerous. They didn't have good resistance curves. Um, we improved those problems by making them safer, having you sit in a good position, having you brace and keep your body under control, um, making them smooth, giving accurate resistance curves. Machines are simply improved designs of barbell exercises. That's all. What do you think of prime fitness equipment, specifically the different smart strength levels where plates are loaded in different areas? I think they're terrible. <laughs> I've used I've used them. Um, prime fitness equipment is so bad, so bad, horrible, just friction, ugh, terrible. Did your physique change a lot when you did hit, or were you always jacked? Um, why don't you build a lipped lean, lean movie star body? <laughs> That's funny. Um, all right. Yeah. So I started doing this when I was 23 years old. So the story is, I've told the story a couple of times. The story is, so I wanted to become a fitness model. I just had a good physique. And I'm like, I could probably be a fitness model. So I called up an agency in New York called Silver Model Management at the time, which is now BMG Models. And he said, yep, you look great, but you have to be bigger. And I was about 188 to 190 pounds at the time. I'd been training my whole life, pretty much, since 16 years old. I'm 23 years old. So I'm like, how do I get bigger? I've been do I was doing the typical growth split. And I was overtrained as hell. And then I came across a video by Dr. Doug McGuff. And he explained how everybody is training wrong. You need to train harder. Less volume, less frequency. And when I watched that video, I was like, wow, this makes sense. Then I bought the book Body by Science. I started reading a lot about it, doing a lot of uh, research. What I did was I cut back my volume, cut back my frequency, and started training deep into failure with less sets, less exercises, less frequency. And within about four to five months, I added 10 pounds. 10 to 15. I went from about 188, 190 to about 202, 203 in about four months. Like that was good for me. And, uh, you know, what happened was people started asking what I was doing because they saw me transform like that. And then I started showing them and teaching this. And that's where I am now. So I was always jacked. Yes, always, always. 11th, 11. As an older guy over 60, been lifting hit style for years. I'm hoping even at my age that strength gains will have some carryover to hypertrophy. Your thoughts? By the way, Golden Era System is awesome. Golden Era System is awesome. And if you guys haven't tried it yet, go to goldenerasystem.com. Get it. You get a free home workout with it too, with exercises you can do at home. So even if you want to just go to the gym one day a week to save time and commute and whatever, you do your other workout at home. I'll show you how to do it. Um, I've had 60 year olds build muscle. Yeah, I think it will. Will it be harder? Yeah, probably. Um, well, you'll, you'll grow muscle. Of course you will. I had, well, Rich Dubin. I got to stop saying my client's full name. <laughs> Rich was in his fifties, I believe 53 and his arms got huge. 
All right, let's see. I seem to be getting a better chest pump on dumbbell uh, press versus CP machine. Do you know why this may be? What's a CP machine? I have an idea. Uh, the machine you're using probably has a lot of friction, a poor resistance curve, and you're just not inroading the muscles as deeply due to an inadequacy in the machine design. This is why you need to be... Um, you know, careful of the machines you use. I mean, some machines are so bad, you're better off using fucking body weight, honestly. Uh, tell me what a CP machine is. I can help you out. Please explain why training range of motion isn't as necessary as people think. That being said, how much range of motion is minimally necessary to actually achieve the stimulating response? Zero range of motion is required to achieve the stimulus. I think my dog is making noise. This stupid asshole. Anyway. Um, so uh, one of my students gained about 13 pounds of muscle in three or four months doing nothing but static exercise, meaning he did not lift a single weight. Your muscles, the function of your muscle is not to produce movement. It is to produce force. A function of your muscle is also preventing movement by producing force. You can produce force and tension and stimulate your muscle with no movement at all. That is why range of motion is not necessary. There is a neurological component to range of motion. So you do want to work your muscles through some kind of range of motion, um, ideally. But the way the actinomyosin overlap, range of motion has nothing to do with the stimulus. You're actually getting more cross bridging and more actinomyosin overlap, staying within this, you know, the, the middle part of the range of motion. Going to the extreme positions in the range of motion result in um, reduced and excessive actinomyosin overlap, less cross bridging and less force and thereby a less Effective stimulus. Let's see. Tips for growing calves have been advised recently to training them every other day because they can handle the frequency, but it seems illogical and counterintuitive. Um, just train them really hard. You know, just do, you know, once or twice a week, do a drop set. Just beat the living hell out of them. I train my calves probably twice a month. My calves have a hard time fitting in joggers now. And I had thin calves when I was little, when I was little, when I was a teenager. I didn't think my calves could grow much either. But then I started training them with high, high, high intensity. And they grew. So, no, I would just recommend training them twice a week. I would do drop sets. Go to failure. Drop the weight. Go to failure again. No rest. Just a continued set. Does using heavy weight to failure produce more stimulation than using lightweight to failure? Or are both the same as you train to failure? They are both the same as long as you train to failure. All of the literature confirms this. I messed up my shoulder throwing axes. When will it heal? I don't know. But you, you probably should literally leave it alone for several weeks. A few weeks. Probably rotator cuff. Or probably you, have, you created some damage in your labrum. I'm in a carb restricted diet. Can I put on muscle doing hit? Hell yeah, you can. You, you, you don't need carbs to build muscle. Carbs certainly help <laughs> with building muscle. Um, adequate carbs and protein combined are anabolic in nature. I have two minutes left, by the way. I'm actually going to look at a gym. I might purchase a big gym and turn it into something cool. Um, I, I, I don't like the lack of traditional gyms so there's a gym for sale for a good price i might buy it and make it into something really cool um but yes you can absolutely put muscle on with a carb restricted diet protein is almost really required carbs help but that does not mean that no carbs mean no muscle they don't ah here we go can my 55 54 year old dad who never lived in his entire life and actually currently suffering from diabetes and some neurological problems start his weightlifting journey with hit absolutely he needs to be weight training he absolutely needs to be weight training 
if your father strength trains, there will be a ridiculous, almost magical improvement in his overall health. Almost magical. Train your father. I trained my father. I trained, um, my father had neurological issues. He suffered from severe leg atrophy because he was a football player and he fucked up his back as a quarterback, getting the shit beat out of him. And over time, he, he, his legs atrophy. And um, I showed him how to strength train, took him through a couple workouts. He's a million times better. <clears throat> All right, a couple minutes, guys. Then I got to go look at this gym. I'm a firm believer of lifts that require skill. I was benching and repping 225 on the Smith machine for 15 reps, <laughs> then switched to the barbell and couldn't even get seven. See, completely, completely different, completely different ballgame. All right. Is it okay to pause at the top of leg press to catch breath? I feel like if I don't, I would hit cardio failure, then muscle failure. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you can, of course. I mean, the stimulus isn't going to be any different, but preferably you wouldn't really want to. <laughs> it's so crazy that we've been molded by sighted train three by ten. Glad you're showing us the truth. They'll look at everyone training their idiots now. Yeah, I mean, not many people know the hit the three by ten history. I mean, think about it. They're very convenient numbers. Three, ten, top three, top ten. Even when um so um um Thomas DeLorme, he didn't start with three of ten. He started with five of ten. But then he started to realize that five sets of ten was way too much. So then he cut it back to three of ten. So believe it or not, three of ten used to be five of ten by Thomas Delorme, and he ended up cutting them back as he was doing uh, rehabilitative work on soldiers. What age do most men peak in testosterone? I don't know. I think it's like early twenties. How do you train to failure doing statics or TSC? This. That's how you train to failure doing statics or time static contraction. My home workout that comes free with Golden Era System shows you a ton of time static contraction exercises. Oh, there's a two minute, 16 second video titled Exercise, not a metaphor for life in Doug McGuff's channel. Have you seen this video? Is that the one where he talks about you should structure your workout around your life and not structure your life? around your workout um if so i have i have having your own gym sounds like a great idea but please don't go bankrupt doing it yeah that's what i'm going to look at i looked at the financials these big gyms don't make a lot of money but the way i see it it's a good tax write-off it's a good place for me to film all kinds of stuff you know, it's basically a, it's basically a film studio slash tax write off. And if the members can cover the overhead and I can break even, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, that's the way I look at it. Hit studio or proper gym? A proper gym. Are you looking to build a Gold's Gym 2.0? I was thinking about calling it Golden Era Health and Fitness. That might be like kind of confusing with Gold's Gym, but Golden Era sounds cool. Golden Era, health and fitness. And what I was going to do with this gym, there's a lot of problems with the gym setting. First of all, women, some women are very uncomfortable going there. My girlfriend is a fucking smoke show. Absolute, utter smoke show. She can't walk in a gym without being bothered. Men will come up to her. Men will bother her. That's why if I were to purchase this gym, I'm going to have a women's section and a 55 and up section, and then a meathead section. So the women can go in the meathead section. The old people can go in the meathead section, but the meatheads are not allowed in the 55 and up section or the women's section. And that is how I'm going to appeal to people. You can go to this gym and stay away from the meatheads. But if you want to be around the meatheads, go ahead. 25-year-old men can't go in either one. Sorry. So, Golden Era Gym. I like that one, too. That's cool. 
How did you come up with Golden Era? <laughs> My copywriter came up with Golden Era. <laughs> I didn't come up with it. I hired a very good copywriter, somebody on Elliot's team. And he did the research. He read everything. And he came up with Golden Era. And then I heard it and I said, that's fucking brilliant. Hit Jim. Um, somebody has called it that. Um, yeah. Can't copy that. Great idea. Might get less meatheads in, but loads of seniors and women. Well, yeah, think about it. Meatheads are everywhere. Um, women and seniors are very intimidated by traditional gyms. So how about a way to accommodate them? I would be the only gym in the Tampa area that has a section for older individuals and a section for women only. I think it's fucking brilliant. Have you trained with John Anthony? Not personally. John lives in Brazil. So you know, I haven't seen John in over a year personally. Uh, but obviously next time I see him, I'm going to train him. All right, guys. Wow, coming up right on an hour. Uh, my appointment to go check out that gym is coming up. Uh, let's see. Since I'm a huge fan of isometrics, your home workout system is awesome. People need to understand the advantages. Yeah, guys. You want to train at home? You want time, static, contraction, isometrics? I had a skinny client. He went from 136 pounds to 143 pounds in like three months. Skinny, hard gainer, doing time, static, contraction. And now he's a time static contraction coach. He teaches tons of people how to do it. And he's getting them awesome results. And he learned it from the home workout. So check out the, uh, you know, go to goldenairsystem.com. I'm giving you the home workout for free. And these time static exercises are awesome if you want to train at home, if you have injuries, um, if you have no equipment. Trust me, they're nuts. I like your dishwashing analogy regarding training one set efficiently and well to failure, not having to continue after the dish has been washed. Yeah, most people have been conditioned that they need to wash their dish three times to make sure it's clean. And they're afraid that if they don't do it three times, their dish isn't going to be clean. Analogically, that's what they're doing with the workout. It's weird. But sweet as... All right, let's see. What if it's with your parent or significant other? Could you join them in the special areas? Um, what are you talking about? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I wouldn't even allow that because guess what? People would, people would just make it up. You know, here's the thing. If your significant other wants to train with you, she can go in the meathead section with you. Right. Women don't like going to the meathead section alone, but my girlfriend and I train in the gyms together. She's terrified to do it by herself, but we'll go together. If you have a, you know, you know, a parent and they want you to train with them, they go in the meathead section with you. That's what's great about having the meathead section, the senior section and the women's section. They can work out on their own comfortably without being bothered by the meatheads. But if they want to work out with you, they can go work out with the meatheads. And then the meatheads get everything they want. The only thing the meatheads aren't going to get are as many women to stare at. But the women who go in the gym, there are women who go in the gym who want to be stared at. And they will be in the meathead section. So everyone is happy. Everyone is happy with this idea. Everyone's happy. So you're going to have women who like to do splits in the middle of the gym. They'll go in the meathead section. They're not going to go do it in front of a bunch of girls. They want the men to look at them. So they go. But the shy women, like my girlfriend, the shy women are going to go to the women's section. You know, I think it's a great freaking idea. All right, guys. This is for me. Again, home workout free. GoldenAirSystem.com. You want to work out at home? You got an injury. You have no equipment. You live in the middle of the desert. You live in the woods like a hermit. Home workout. The home workout program is going to be good for you, all right? And you'll get it for free. So go to goldenairsystem.com. Hit the like, subscribe, bell, notification icon. I have a video coming tomorrow. Split routine versus full body. That video is coming tomorrow with the evidence, all right? So I normally post the videos around 11 or noon. Check that out. It's edited very well as usual. And um, it's going to be very interesting what you find out about full body and split routine.
That was my truth. Some women love attention. Yeah, so what's great is the, the women don't have to go to the women's section. They have the option. The men just can't go in the women's section. So if you're a woman, <laughs> what's kind of funny is if you're a woman and you're in the meathead section, guess what? The men know you're there for that reason. Now the men, you know, if you're in the meathead section, you're telling men you want to be hit on. You want to be stared at. So don't bitch and complain if they come in, you know, shoot their shot. You know, <laughs> I swear if I had a woman come up and say, this guy's being creepy. Well, are you training in the meathead section? Yes. Then go to the women's section. Shut up. Let me know. Franchise in Phoenix. Mark, if it works, I think it's, oh, man, I, I, I'm going to have to delete this video so someone doesn't copy it. <laughs> I gained one to 1.2 centimeters on your, my arms with TSC training around five times a week. 10 to 50 minutes for a whole body in 40 days. Nice. Nice. All right, guys. So that was it. Again, Nautilus Bulletins. Uh, Google Nautilus Bulletins if you want to go over more of what, what we've been over today. Like, subscribe, bell notification icon. Home workout free with Golden Era System. Click the link in my description if you want lifetime access to me as your personal coach. Book a call with me if you want me to, if you want unlimited access to me, which is pretty useful. And I'll see you guys next time.